Good morning, everybody. It is 9am, so we will get started with our webinar today from the ILO's Global Business and Disability Network. My name is Alicia Matthews, um, and online we also have Jürgen and Stefan, and we are from the disability team um, at the ILO, um, as well as um, our, our leader, Stefan, is, is on the webinar too. Welcome. Um, as, uh, as you've joined a Zoom webinar, you would have automatically joined on mute um, and without video, but we do have the webinar chat function. So if you need anything, um, please send me a message. Um, very honoured and, and pleased to have Bruce Roche here with us today as moderator for today's webinar. So Bruce, without further ado, um, thank you. And I will hand over to you um, to start off today's session. Thanks, Alicia. Hello, everybody. So my name is Bruce Roach. I'm uh, in charge of CSR and Solidarity uh, within the ADECO group uh, in France. So you can uh, appreciate my French accent. Sorry for that. Try to make myself understandable. Fair enough. Uh, it's a great honor for me to moderate this first uh, webinar in the 2019 series. Uh, we have attendees today from the private sector, from NGOs, from DP, DPOs, universities and higher education institutions, UN entities and independent consultants from a variety of countries uh, that span from Norway to India, through Nigeria, South Africa, Italy, United Kingdom, France, of course, uh, Switzerland with the ILO folks, uh, Philippines, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Peru, Spain, Colombia, Australia and many more. So happy uh, that you all are able to be there. Um, maybe uh, as a start, a brief introduction to the Global Business and Disability Network from the ILO. It's an employer-led initiative that works to uh, promote the inclusion of people with disabilities in workplaces around the world. Uh, our members include multinational enterprises, national business and disability network uh, from many countries and inter international uh, not-for-profit and disabled people organizations from all over the world. Um, the network runs a series of webinars uh, as a way of promoting and sharing good practices in disability workplace inclusion. And uh, uh, maybe uh, if people uh, experience technical difficulties through uh, this uh, webinar, we uh, uh, ask you to, to contact uh, Zoom and Alicia. Uh, and we can send you a message in, uh, in the contact details if needed. Uh, everything is recorded, so uh, be aware. And uh, I, I'd like to welcome uh, A-Media. Uh, we will be providing today's captioning services. And you can update your captioning in view in the Zoom under the settings, uh, accessibility, uh, closed caption, font size. Um, so today's webinar topic is about affirmative recruitment practices, how to ensure an inclusive experience for job seekers with disabilities. And we are happy to uh, uh, welcome uh, our first speakers today from live from Italy. And from uh, the Accenture team, we have Aldo Pazzoli, who is the management consultant and works for Accenture Strategy since 2011. Uh, we also have Alberto Lapi, who is Human Resources uh, Department, uh, Employee Relations and HR Policies uh, uh, for Italy, Central Europe and Greece at Accenture. Uh, both have uh, lots of experience. We are happy to, uh, to have you on board today, Alberto and Aldo. Uh, many things to, to share. and. Uh, uh, we'll be happy to uh, uh, hear you uh, and see you uh, with your case study about the job station program that supports healthy and productive workplace inclusive for people with, with mental health conditions. So uh, maybe before you start, uh, there is a time at the end of both presentation. We have another one uh, running after live from Australia with Robin. Uh, at the end of both presentation, you'll have uh, the, the possibility to ask questions to the presenters uh, through the question and answers button on your screen. So uh, not being too long, I leave the floor to uh, Alberto and Aldo from uh, the Accenture team. Benvenuto. Thank you very much. Merci. Buongiorno. Thank you very much. Merci. Um, uh, so I'm Alberto Lapi. Um, thank you very much for this invitation and the possibility to share and the possibility to uh, to listen and understand from the other experiences. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the for sharing the presentation. Yeah, 
great. Thank you very much. So we can we can start from uh, from the first slide just for explaining that uh, Accenture about three years ago uh, decided that uh, inclusion and diversity uh, contents would have become a priority and not an uh, ancillary program but a priority. The dimension of inclusion for us are gender, persons with disability, new generation, persons with different sexual orientation, religious and cultural inclination. So um, the reason of this decision, the decision of uh, considering inclusion as a priority, is uh, first of all related to business. In the sense that we believe that uh, if an employee can be totally herself, himself, uh, she or he can be more creative and productive. Of course, in this meanwhile, we have also decided to stress the importance of uh, a, big, uh, a big picture from a, a, a values point of view. So strong interest in the differences and at the same time, clear definition of a value picture, common value picture. If it is possible to uh, go in the second slide, thank you very much. So this is ju just to say that uh, that in the difference we have uh, um, uh, we have a value. Um, it's important from a business perspective. In the disability, we have an ability. So if you can go uh, in the se in the second in the, in the third sorry slide. Thank you very much. Just to say that uh, this is the uh, the framework um that we are implementing in implementing relating uh, uh, persons with disability program the title of this framework is from words to facts because an employee with disability judges the quality of the employer efforts from the concrete inclusion inclusion actions not from slogan. Uh, only if an employer is able to demonstrate with facts that uh, it believes in inclusion of persons with disability, or, or, or only in this case, uh, an employee with disability will start to, to be included and will decide, will decide to be included. Um, the framework of this, uh, um, uh, our framework consists in four axes. Um, in uh, 20 actions, but I don't want to go into details. Uh, the first axis is uh, consists in education. We believe that only changing the culture of our people we can include. So we uh, implemented the a mental health training uh, for um, senior manager and manager. We implemented uh, uh, a lot of uh, training section, sessions on, uh, uh, on change management and on case management. Secondly, uh, we, talk, we, 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 we try to implement actions related to people care. So we created a team that uh, listen employees that is available to collect open point requests. Um, then also for people care, a psychological coaching, individual coaching, um, a special health found for persons with disability. So 
uh, we talk with uh, we talk with facts. Third axis, self declaration. We believe that when an employee decide to self declare his or her uh, disability, this change changes the organization. So we meet people, we we work on uh, the single position, the single uh, uh, the, the single persons because uh, their declaration will help the organization to change. The third axis, the third X of uh, this uh, of our panel of activities uh, is uh, uh, called job stations. And uh, we are proud of this. Uh, job station allows persons with mental uh, disabilities to enter the organization. And so I leave uh, to Aldo the word and uh, the possibility to explain what uh, uh, job station is. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you JobStation, which is basically uh, a project that now is becoming a platform. And I will tell you why. If you can go next slide. Okay, you all know how uh, unemployment is a crucial issue for people with disability. And if we then see the unemployment for people with mental illness, we see that numbers are dramatic. What I want to say is that uh, being employed is a natural uh, relief. It's natural uh, therapy. It's a, like a medicine for those kind of people. And uh, what we did with JobStation is to uh, answer to this challenge. If we can go next slide. which is including people with disability and namely with mental illness in the workplace. People with disability, it's already a very delicate, a very delicate uh, group of people. But if you delve into the categories when you talk about mental illness, people are literally scary by them. Are scary because they think that we bring strange people, the people that have problems uh, in the workplace, while those people, I want to say one thing, maybe everyone knows, but I want to uh, repeat it. Every single person with mental illness or suffering mental health problems has a full IQ. It doesn't have any kind of limitation. They are only fragile under a stress perspective, stress management perspective. But you should not forget from now on that any person that is included in the workplace having mental illness has been vetted, and I repeat, vetted by their doctors. Means that are people where the therapy is working well, they are stabilized, medicine and therapy with a psychologist and so on and so forth are working well, and so it's natural for them to carry on and start working. If you can go next slide, I will tell you more. JobStation actually uh, are smart working centers. So offices uh, that are in uh, those organizations, which are foundation, NGOs, and so on and so forth, that have the tutors, they have expert tutors training psychology that assist the people with mental illness in starting working, in starting maybe for the first time or in some cases in restarting working working after a long time of uh, uh, suffering but which is the power of job station the power of job station is that we don't take a person who suffer mental illness who had uh, such a fragility and we throw in to the office in a, for example in a large uh, in a large open space or alone in an office but we start from a protected environment with a protected environment that is equipped, as you will see, uh, with, uh, with tables, with desks, with chairs, with all the technology we need to work, they need to work, but having next to them a psychologist, a tutor, 
who is able to support them in overcoming all the burdens, all the fragilities, all the fears they can have. And after a number of years, we will see this, it works. It works because this smart working center, together with smart working technology, so internet connection, uh, laptop, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful earphones, and so on and forth, and abilities, their abilities that they have, we have been able to allow to move from barriers to inclusion. Means that those people are not anymore people with disability, with mental illness, but colleagues. Next slide, please. Here you can see a picture of a job station. Actually, on the left, uh, it's the working space, so it's uh, similar to an office. On the right, uh, there is a picture of the, let's say, uh, break area, relax area. It's uh, basically they are offices hosted by those organizations who are able to deal with people with such fragility. If you go next slide, there are a couple of pictures. And again, uh, on the right, you see the desk before, the one before. On the right, you see the desk of the tutors, and the tutors, the previous slide. Yeah, uh, the two tutors, uh, those are the two uh, psychologists. They support people. Literally, they support them in talking, speaking, understanding where are their problems, which are their problems, but they never do their job because at the end, the job they do is, uh, let's say, a low complexity uh, activity that is, uh, uh, that is not an activity with short timelines, with short um, deadlines, means that no stress generation, but they are activities that can be performed from, uh, from remote and that can be, let's say, um, plan in advance. If you go, if you can go next slide, we will show you the five, uh, the five um, job station. Actually, this is the area of Milano where we have four, plus there is one in Roma. It didn't uh, fit into the map, into the chart, but actually there are four in Milano uh, area, metropolitan area, and one in Rome. Uh, the fact that, that there are five gives you the idea of how many people um, 70 so far we have inserted in the workplace. If you can go to the next slide. This is an overview of the task. As I told you before, the task must be, uh, all, must have only one characteristic, that they must not be uh, tasked with uh, tight, short deadlines. Otherwise, they degenerate stress. Uh, they must be tasks that are planable, that can be forecasted. And on the left, you can see how they are pertaining the technology area, a little amount, especially big office, uh, project management office and support uh, activities. And the last one is administrative task and accounting performed for the most various uh, corporate functions. On the right, we have uh, a more detailed, uh, a more detailed list. I think you will all receive uh, the, um, the documentation, the slides, so you can delve into them. If you can go next slide. we see how the process is strong, how the process of onboarding is clear. First of all, we always ask companies to identify activities in advance. We don't ask them, okay, do you want a person with mental illness? It's not like that. It's, do you have a work, do you have a job, do you have an activity that, key, that can be successfully performed remotely, that has medium to low complexities, and it does not have short uh, deadlines. Then, according to this activity and to the nature of this activity, we select candidates. Basically, we present the companies a short list. The companies, in the meantime, appoints a supervisor, means that every single job stationer has a supervisor, which is a person in the company that uh, work with him 
or with her. And then there are recruitment interviews. Recruitment interviews are with the supervisor, are with us, job station team, and are with the tutor in order to allow to have a real and let's say uh, open discussion and interview with candidates. After that, it starts the internship. And after that, at the beginning, very frequently, like once or twice per month, uh, and then a little bit more like every two months, we have periodic checks with the tutors that everything is going well with the person. If we can go next slide. Uh, we want to underline how we are innovating. We are innovating in addressing a tangible measure in a collaborative way on the topic of mental health placement in the workforce. Then in the employment on people with disability, we focus on the very delicate category of people with, of people with mental illness. Then what we want to say, we want to say that we transform their disability in abilities and that under a cultural perspective is very powerful. Then we're using technologies to facilitate the day-to-day -day operation and we have developed a professional development model means a career uh, track and path uh, model to help them have an actual progression and this we actually have a very strong collaboration with all the actors because with the tutors and with the supervisor is a constant collaboration. After this, uh, we can see some results. The, the, the benefit for, for the company and then the results. First the benefits and then the results. Uh, the benefits are for the people with mental illness because they can work they can express their abilities and work is an actual therapy for companies because in countries uh, where this is uh, requested, we can comply with the, um, with the law on, uh, on the employment of people with mental disability or with people with disability. But most of all, we create a strong collaboration between parties. Society, as a whole, benefits from this. The area of Milano's job station is recognized by therapists as an actual solution, a concrete solution. I can go on the last one. Time is ended. Yes, I know the time is gone. And we will just see the figures. We have five job stations active, 70 job placement, and 25 people working with Accenture Italy. 17 other companies are hiring through job station. Thank you very much. We can watch the brief video and uh, available for your questions. Thank you so much. I'll just share the video now. Um, and just a reminder, we're having some questions come through the Q&A, which is fabulous. Um, and we will, we will come to, que to questions after the second presentation. Um, so just um, give me a moment and you'll see the video on screen. La disabilità ha tanti volti. Esiste una disabilità fisica e una disabilità psichica. Una sotto gli occhi di tutti e una che vorremmo nascondere anche a noi stessi. Lo stigma sociale su chi ha sofferto di disturbi della salute mentale è forte. Accenture agisce concretamente per sradicare questo pregiudizio, impegnandosi a costruire un ambiente di lavoro inclusivo e accessibile. Job Stations aiuta le persone che si sono smarrite a causa della loro fragilità psichica a ritrovare la strada. Le accompagna nel tragitto, ne tutela la sicurezza con l'assegnazione di mansioni telelavorabili all'interno di un contesto sicuro. Un progetto vincente per l'azienda, per la società, ma soprattutto per l'individuo. Come dimostra la storia di Cristiano, che seguendo il percorso di Job Stations ha raggiunto una meta che sembrava lontanissima o inarrivabile. Sono uscito da una situazione veramente nera. Dopo tanto tempo, tanti ricoveri, tante medicine, io ora sono qui 
e sono contento. Jobstation è veramente la soluzione per chi realmente ha questo genere di problemi. Grazie mille uh, Alberto and uh, and Aldo uh, for this uh, presentation and for this uh, very explicit uh, video and thanks for the, all the great job. We'll now hand over to our second speaker who is uh, Robin Boitel, sorry for the spelling of, of, of your name. Uh, Robin is the Director for Diversity and Inclusion uh, Uh, within the uh, Australian Public Service Commission, and she's responsible for developing strategy and policy to support a diverse and inclusive APS workforce. Um, she She's there for, it's late at night now already in Australia. So uh, Robin, it's now your time. Can you please activate your microphone? We Thank you, Bruce. You. Good. <laughs> Um, yes, it is getting um, close to my bedtime in Canberra. Um, just on that, that presentation with Eldo and um, Alberto, I would say we agree with, um, with what you said in your presentation around inclusion. So it's more about the making the workplace more inclusive. Um, so around an inclusive culture and in Australia, we are actually working towards that as well. There's a, a similar program in the Australian Public Service Uh, called the Dandelion Program, but um, it's for people who uh, have autism. And again, they sort of set it up as a pilot to um, put people in a more controlled environment because we're moving towards open plan. So to make sure that it's a controlled environment so that the people can um, perform at their best. So that's another, another one that you might want to have a look at. And I found your presentation very interesting. So thank you. Okay, so we have a number of affirmative measures in the public service and tonight, um, or this morning for you, we're going to just speak about one of them and that's our affirmative measure called recruitability. Um, and sorry, my lights have just gone out here so it's a little bit dark for me to see my notes. But um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Next slide, please. I'll quickly give you um, a bit of an overview of the Australian Public Service Commission. And throughout the presentation, I may refer to, the, to it as the Commission or the APSC, um, just to, to shorten that. So we are a small central agency and we're within the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio and we are under the operate, operation of the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Act of 2013. We have, uh, with our resourcing, uh, we have a head of agency and he is the Australian Public Service Commissioner and supported by a Deputy Commissioner. The Commission, as I said, is quite small. We only have around 200 staff and they're mostly based in Canberra and we also have a small office in Sydney. Uh, our funding, currently our funding is 50% comes from government appropriation and the other 50% comes from uh, other government agencies, which is on a fee-for-service basis, or we have a, um, subscriptions and it's all under a memorandum understanding, so we have quite a few MOUs. And our purpose is to actually help shape the Australian Public Service workforce Um, to make sure that it's, it's modern and we've got modernised employment frameworks in place and we've got the workforce for the future to support the government in delivering the um, government policies. Next slide, please. So we have some statutory responsibilities as well. So most public servants are, are bound by the Public Service Act of 1999 and that's how they're engaged in their employment. And so under the Act, we have a number of responsibilities around developing, promoting, reviewing, and evaluate the APS employment policies and practices. 
Um, we also contribute to the learning, development, and career management, uh, contribute and foster leadership across the public service, provide advice and assistance on public service matters uh, to other agencies, and we also promote high standards of integrity and conduct in the APS. We also have a couple of other responsibilities and that is um, Secretariat support for a remuneration tribunal and the Defence Force Remuneration Tribunal. And for this um, financial year, we also have some additional responsibilities in supporting uh, the independent review of the Australian Public Service. Um, and that is, they have a website as well. So the whole of the public service is under review um, to see um, how it is now and how we can actually shape ourselves better to, for the future. Next slide, please. So when we come to uh, our workplace diversity, we have a number of legislative obligations which our agencies um, have to abide by. And some of those come under the Public Service Act where every agency head must establish a workplace diversity program. Um, so that's where sort of we come in with strategies and policies and to help enact that, we have the Australian Public Service Commissioner's Directions, um, which is really sort of how agencies are to operate. And that's where our, we have our three affirmative measures and they are applied um, across all agencies to help improve diversity across all classification levels. We have an affirmative measure on Indigenous employment. Um, we have an affirmative measure on disability and we have an affirmative measure called recruitability scheme, and that's the one we'll speak more about tonight. So in Australia, we also have the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992, um, which uh, is, we also have to make sure that we do not discriminate based on a person's um, disability. And there's a, a definition that we use around disability as well, and that's the same definition that the Australian Bureau of Statistics uses. And there's also, of course, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And in Australia, we also have the National Disability Strategy 2010 to 2020. Next slide, please. So under, sitting underneath our legislation, we also have um, some policy obligations as well. And we have the As One Making It Happen, the APS Disability Employment Strategy Within the strategy, there are um, a number of key focus areas, and that is what we use to try and implement uh, across all agencies um, in the Australian Public Service. So when the Australian Bureau of Statistics ran a survey in 2015, it found that almost one in five Australians recorded living with disability. Um, so the APS is committed to improving the representation of people with disability in our workforce, and the strategy detail some actions around improving the attraction, engagement and retention of people with disability for the Australian Public Service workforce. And of course, the goal of the strategy is to increase representation of employees with disability across the whole of the APS, including Indigenous people with disability. And we also have three other diversity um, employment strategies as well, but we're just talking about the disability employment strategy tonight. And the benefits of us doing that to increase representation in our workforce is to help us respond better to the needs of community in policy development, program delivery and service delivery. And it also helps us better understand and communicate if we can understand what's the, the needs of the Australian community. Next slide, please. So the affirmative measure recruitability, um, as I said, it is legislated um, and the aims of the, the scheme is to support the increased representation of people with disability in the APS, improve disability confidence of hiring managers and improve confidence of people with disability to put forward their skills and capabilities. So the recruitability scheme was first run as a pilot in 2013 and it started with 15 agencies. The scheme um, was evaluated after the pilot and then implemented as a, as a full-blown program in 2015, and it was reviewed in 2017. Next slide, please. So the principles of the scheme um, is 
Applicants with disability who apply under the recruitability and meet the minimum requirements are progressed to the next stage of a selection process. So it doesn't guarantee applicants a position, but it just recognises that they, um, if they meet the minimum requirements, then let's move into the next stage of the selection process. So there's no displacement of applicants who would otherwise have been shortlisted for further assessment and agencies manage their recruitment activities within the boundaries of legislation and policy. Next slide, please. So how the, the scheme works, it's an opt-in scheme um, and agencies can apply the recruitability scheme to any or all advertised vacancies. We have some standard wording, which I have there um, on the presentation about the recruitability scheme and it does encourage um, people to, to opt into the scheme should they choose to. Now, if they choose to opt in, they, they are declaring that they have a disability. They don't declare what their disability is, only that they have a disability. And then if they do meet those minimum requirements for the vacancy, as I said, they're advanced to the next stage of the assessment process. And the definition of disability is a person has a disability if they report, they have a limitation, restriction or impairment which has lasted or is likely to last for at least six months and restricts everyday activities. And that's the same definition that the Australian Bureau of Statistics uses. Um, so in, in practice, in recruitment, merit remains the basis for engagement or promotion in the Australian Public Service. Next slide, please. So when we had a look at the stats about, um, you may recall I said the recruit, recruitability scheme can be applied to all vacancies. Um, and I just got pulled some data the other day to show that on average, um, you can see from 2013 when the pilot started, the use of recruitability for vacancies um, ramped up quite steeply. And it's almost sort of starting to, to plateau out now in, in 2018, but it's sort of averaged around 50% over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. And um, we also have um, to help our managers. Uh, recruitment is a devolved activity in the Australian Public Service, so each agency does their own recruitment activity. We also have some inclusive recruitment around dismantling barriers with some guidance. And why we have that is because inclusive approaches to recruitment remove barriers to employment for potential employees. Um, if you have barriers in place, you, you're potentially missing out on a, um, a really good talent pool that you would otherwise not be able to access. And how do we do that? Um, similar to the last presentation, we talk about job analysis and design. So it's about how do we design our job, be, be clear on the inherent requirements and the core activities, tasks or skills that are essential to doing that job. We use inclusive language and we also look at the assessment process to make sure that it's flexible and that we apply reasonable adjustments as well. Our selection panels, um, we ask our selection panels to be disability confident and comprise of a diverse range of people and also candidate care is a really important factor uh, with that as well, as is the onboarding. So to have early discussions with new employees to identify any reasonable adjustments that may be needed in the workplace. Next slide, please. So what do we know? Well, we know over the last three years, the recruitability scheme has applied to 47.6% on average to our advertised vacancies. Um, however, the representation of employees with disability in the Australian Public Service has remained steady at 3.7% since 2015. The, the, there is a, continues to be a disparity in the number of employees with disability who self-identify in our HR systems, which is 3%, um, as opposed to staff who identify as having a disability in our APS employee census, which is at 8.7%. So the 15 year trend where the number of employees with disability leaving the APS outweighs the number of people with disability joining the APS. So we, that, that sort of the, the data story can tell you quite a lot. And the lessons that we've learned is the employment outcomes 
were not as we expected. Um, if we're applying recruitability to almost half of our advertised jobs, but we're still staying at 3.7 for 15 years, um, something's, something's not right um, with that. And not all applicants and agencies have a clear understanding of the policy. And inclusive recruitment education program is needed. So we're refreshing our guidance material and we're actively engaging with our agencies to promote affirmative measures. Next slide, please. So the key takeaway message for us is, you can have all the legislation strategies and policies, but to really make a difference, we have to focus on building that inclusive workplace and practices. Next slide, please. So thank you, and my details are there. If um, anyone wants to contact me out of session on any of that or any of the other diversity and inclusion policies and strategies that we have. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Robin, and, and particularly for joining late in the day, Australian time. <laughs> Um, maybe now we will uh, hand over to the Q&A session. So through the Zoom system, uh, uh, it's, you had the opportunity uh, to, to ask some questions. I see nine online. I'll hand over to Alicia, who will moderate this part of the webinar. Alicia, are you online? Yes, I am. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you to our speakers. Um, we have 19 minutes left for questions, so that is um, fantastic. And um, we promise that we will finish um, sharp on 10 a.m. Um, Central Eastern Time as well. Um, so my first question um, that I'll ask, so Alberto and Aldo, the question that came through is, um, for your program, Job Stations, what is the role of Accenture in this initiative? Um, it seems that um, people with mental health conditions are not directly employed by Accenture. So I'll hand over to you um, to talk us through that, that response. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the answer is uh, yes. Um, people are employed by Accenture and they have a regular, real contract. Uh, what we do is uh, pay a monthly fee to the job station who hosts and tutors the people, but uh, they are all uh, Accenture employee. And the beautiful information is that we don't have only trainees or internship, we have also like 12 permanent contracts. Means people that are working with us from at least three years and more, which is the message here. The message is that they are working for real because we have, an, um, let's say, a permanent employment process that ask every single project who want to candidate a job station for permanent hiring to prepare a dossier. We have a dossier with all, uh, with all the information and basically they push like hell to have their job stationers employed because they work, they do actual stuff. They do reporting, they prepare Excel, they work on database and many other things like this. So the answer is yes, people are employed by Accenture. And sorry for not having uh, a clear position on this. I will learn from that. Thank you very much. Um, and we had another question come through about job stations. Um, is the initiative implemented in Italy only right now? Um, are there plans to implement the initiative across countries where you operate in? Uh, okay. Um, um, uh, job station for now is uh, implemented in Italy. Uh, by the way, we are scaling uh, this model out of Accenture, pro bono, of course, <laughs> uh, in the sense that uh, we are proposing uh, to our clients all around Italy this model, because job station is uh, a trilateral model, as you have understood. Uh, there is a uh, a non-governative organization, there is a, a candidate with mental illness, there is a, a company. This is uh, the three actors of the model, the three stakeholders. We are trying to uh, scale, scaling, to export this model 
in other companies and this uh, is succeeding this is happening now we would like to go out of italy and, uh, and this moment is an opportunity for us to present job station all around the world i mean uh, in a lot of countries we have had the opportunity to present uh, to all the uh, Accenture countries uh, this model, job station, because we won a, 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 um, a prize, but however, uh, this is not so important. So we are trying to export the model. We are at the moment, we have job station only in Italia, in Italy. Um, yeah. Yes, and uh, the beauty of, uh, of JobStation is that the ingredients are very clear, as Alberto said, NGO that host the people, a company who wants to hire, plus people that are good candidates for the open position. And uh, we have a blueprint, uh, we have an operating model, we have everything we need. Uh, what we are looking for, for solid co co um, for solid um, partners in the field of mental illness and with a corporation that want to innovate bringing on board those kind of people that are professionals. Thank you both so much and we have we're having such good questions come through um, but I am conscious of time so um, Robin there's a few questions come through for you so I'll um, I'll um, um, ask some questions of you now um, and for those of you who have um, asked questions we will try and get to as many as we can but I don't think we will be able to cover all of them in the next um, 10 minutes or so um, but Robin for you we had a question around how is the as one strategy being evaluated um, that because um, the data shows that people with disability employed by APS hasn't increased since 2016. So over to you, Robin. Thank you, um, and thank you for the question. That's a really good one. The strategy actually doesn't expire until the end of this year. Um, and what we're finding is the key actions in the disability employment strategy are very similar to the key actions in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment strategy as well. And that strategy is one that I've only just evaluated and I'm in the process of developing what the future might look like for that strategy. Um, and, and what we have found, it, it really is coming back to inclusive um, workplaces and for a workplace where people can feel that they, they have trust in the workplace and their managers to actually um, to disclose that they have a disability. Um, it's not mandatory to to self-identify in our systems, it is voluntary, but to make the workplace more inclusive. And when we do that uh, evaluation, we will follow probably a similar um, formula and format to what we did with the Commonwealth Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Employment Strategy, which um, took into account perspectives from um, a number of agencies, different sizes, um, different uh, functions, as well as including our employees in that as well through focus groups and to get feedback on um, what they were experiencing in the workplace. Um, some lessons we learnt from the other evaluation was, um, you know, if you have positive workplace experiences, you're actually going to be more productive. People are going to want to join. We need to look at what our employee value proposition is, which is something that we're looking at from the public service as a whole. Um, so it really is what do we have to offer and to make it more inclusive so people of all ability can participate in the workforce. So that evaluation will be, will be quite interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Um, we have one more question for you as well, um, sure. which I think is a great question. What is meant by selection panel members being disability confident? How do you achieve that? Uh, we're working actually quite hard with um, agencies in terms of delivering disability confidence training. So 
Um, what does that mean? What we have found are if managers have a fear factor where they have really good intentions, but they're just too scared that they're going to slip up and make a mistake and inadvertently um, offend somebody. So we're actually working uh, quite closely with, with our agencies in um, what does it mean? We, in Australia, we also have a National Disability um, Recruitment Coordinator, which is another government funded program. And we work quite closely with him as well in getting together to do some training with, some, with the managers about what does it mean for a person to have disability. And it's not always a physical disability, there's the invisible disability. Um, and it really is just about making reasonable adjustments um, that anyone could expect to have so that they can do their job. So we work quite closely with them to try and um, make sure that they're feeling more comfortable to have conversations with people as well. And just to ask what reasonable adjustment do you need in the workplace? So it, it really is on both sides, to get both parties to be more confident to have a conversation with each other and to work out what can happen in the workplace to make it easier for everybody. Thanks, Robin. Um, Aldo and Alberto, we'll go back to you. Um, we had a question come through saying, what is your experience in supporting individuals who are already at work, um, who have mental illnesses and whose jobs are not low complexity or predictable? For example, mid-level managers. Yeah. Yes. Um, two kind of... Uh, initiative. Uh, the first one uh, we have implemented the uh, telephone um, call center 24 hours a day for seven days um, for all our employees uh, in which and this, it's possible to use this uh, call center for presenting the specific situation that each of us can uh, face, uh, negative situation, personal, mental situation that each of one can uh, face during uh, uh, our life cycle, our work life cycle. Um, after this uh, first con telephone, first contact, uh, we offer uh, a psychological um, path with a specialist, with a psychologist, with the aim of uh, uh, helping, so uh, with a specific uh, medical help. What we have uh, experienced is the fact that uh, we have not the skills for help persons when uh, a mental health uh, problem issues. I have, uh, I work in HR, but I don't have uh, the psychological tools for helping. I need to, to involve uh, external specialists, and this is what we have done. The same for uh, a more specialistic help uh, is for uh, colleagues that uh, um, have a, um, a, an, an invalidation, specific invalidation. So we know that there are different kinds of uh, uh, disabilities. Hidden, uh, more clear um, um, disability about which we want to, to, to explain, to declare other that we don't want to share. Um, we offer also specific uh, uh, psychological help for uh, physical disabilities, also all, always with uh, um, medical external uh, doctors. The last thing that uh, I would like to add uh, is related, uh, even if it's not completely pertinent, but let me say, just for sharing, we have, we have decided to add uh, uh, an help for our employees uh, that are mother 
and the father of uh, uh, children with disabilities. We uh, decided to create uh, a group uh, with a psychologist. The name of this group is uh, um, Together for Us. Um, these colleagues have just uh, closed this path because it was a uh, uh, five, six meetings. Uh, they have just complete um, a couple of weeks ago this path uh, because uh, we uh, understood that uh, there are also an issue related to uh, the employees that are um, father and mother. These paths are changing Accenture uh, from a quality perspective. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Aldo. We do have many more questions, but unfortunately, um, that is time um, for the Q&A session. Um, Bruce, I'll hand back over to you. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, all presenters and attendees and the media. Um, we had many uh, relevant issues today that were raised. Um, maybe uh, Alicia will make uh, something available on the screen. It's a poll on screen to provide your feedback. Uh, on today's webinar, so please feel free to, to fill it in. Um, also, will be provided a, a link on where to access to this webinar recording. Uh, it will be sent uh, to all attendees uh, via email tomorrow. The video will be available on the Global Business and Disability Network website and on YouTube in the, in the coming days. So please uh, uh, share your, the links with uh, your networks. We need you to, uh, to make it viral. Um, next webinar, uh, Alicia, will be on uh, May 22nd and the topic will be the employee resource groups. And our first speaker for this session will be Kate Nash. Uh, more details will follow from the ILO team uh, shortly. Um, for the people that uh, joined today and who are not members of the Global uh, Business and Disability Network, you can learn more from the network's website. So it's businessanddisability.org, business and disability in full. Dot org. Um, it's been a pleasure being uh, there with you today. Um, and uh, thanks again to all our presenters. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Aldo and uh, Alberto. Uh, thanks to uh, the ILO team for facilitating. And thank you all for attending. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you again online and to other uh, uh, ILO Global Business and Disability Network activities. Thank you all. Thank you, Bruce, and everyone, you should see the polling on screen, so please vote. Um, your feedback is really important to us so we can um, take on board your feedback for our future webinar sessions. But um, thank you, Bruce, so much for um, facilitating our conversation and thanks to, the, um, to our speakers from APSC and Accenture um, from, from um, the ILO Global Business and Disability Network. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.